Today, for a few minutes, it's going to be very few. Because I still have another thing to do. Let's do this together. Psalm 85 and then verse 6. Open the word of God. Psalms 85 and then verse 6. And when we are done, we are going to read the book of the Endings. Revelation chapter 3 and then 14 to 21. Are you there? Are you there? Psalms 85 verse 6. The Bible says, as you see, when you read the Bible, please take note of the, the question mark, the punctuations and all of that. The Bible says in 85.6, Scripture says, Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? And then that's a question. The psalmist was asking, will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? You might have been at that point where you're asking the Lord, God, will you not revive me? It means that when a people is revived, how do you know? Rejoicing. Can you see that? That, that rejoicing is not, is not uh, somebody, when I was just, when I just gave my life to Christ and I was in a particular church, a man did not like our church uh, because he said, why are you always happy? He said, there's no time for sober reflection. And I said, Jesus had died. What should we be crying over again? He's resurrected. Uh, but you see, a revived people is known by their rejoice. He says, so that your people may rejoice in you. It's not that so that they can be happy. I told you that joy is from the himself. Happiness is just an expression even of joy. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Somebody say, when I am married, I will be happy. Hmm. Is that true? Is that true? Glory to God. Joy is on the inside. All right, because if that is getting married makes us joyful, then single people will never have joy. And I would have been married since the age of 12, so that I can quickly have joy. Amen. All right, Revelation chapter 3. All right, 14. Um, I'm going there. Um, Revelation chapter 3. Um, I love you to go there also, but it will be on the screen, 14 to 21. And the Bible says, unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, right? This thing says the amen, the faithful, and the true witness. The beginning of the creation of God. I know your works. Uh, so God knows your works. I know your works neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm, I neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That's where we ended last week. All right, but let's take it further today. Because you say, I am rich. I have become wealthy and I have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, or poor, blind, and naked. I can't sell you to buy from me. You see that word me there is in capitals. Um, that's tell you start with the capital. That tells you it's talking about the Christ. I can't sell you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and not your eyes with eye with sir, I sir, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebook and chastened. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Look at somebody and say, be zealous. And repent. All right, so let's just go to the end. And then, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him. And he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. To him who overcomes. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. I don't know how the thrones in heaven will look like, but we'll sit on his throne. Uh, I, I don't know. So don't use your natural eyes. Uh, to say that PFA is sitting on the chair, I cannot sit there. I don't know how it will look like. Uh, but he, or maybe the throne will be a throne that he will just have his name. We do not know. But we will know for certain when we get there. He said, I will grant to see it uh, even on my throne. Uh, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. I believe there is an overcomer's throne. And that throne is guaranteed uh, for those who have received first the reviving even of the Lord. For a few minutes this morning, and I sincerely mean it, I don't know whether I would do it, but I sincerely mean it. Uh, I want to teach you what I've titled the revival of fervency. Look at him and say the revival, the revival. of fervency. The, the revival of fervency. Father, thank you because the entrance of the word will give light, give understanding to us simple folks. Father, we've come to learn at your face and make my tongue the pen of red writer. Lord, help me to distill and write the word of life upon the spirit of your people. After now, Daddy, make us better people. Let your counsel be established. Let the purpose of any word be fulfilled. And let us, O oh God, walk even in the light of your glory. We exalt and we magnify you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 
and amen. Please be seated in God's presence. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, the revival of Vabensi. Give me the title, shout it. What's the title? <laughs> Today we read about the church in Laodicea. And what we call that church in Laodicea is what you call the lukewarm church. A good and accurate reading of scriptures and biblical history shows us that the church was not always a lukewarm church. That church was not always a lukewarm church. So how did it become a lukewarm church? And how do I know it wasn't battered as a lukewarm church? I have certain um, reasons that can help to um, amplify that statement. Um, the portion of scriptures we read, the Bible used the word Jesus was speaking to them, the resurrected Christ was speaking to them in Revelation 3 and verse 19, and he used the word repent. Repent. That word repent tells you that you have been going in a direction before, uh, but now I want you to turn from that direction and go, back, and go, to, and go backwards. Now, go, become what you were before. Uh, another word he said, he said be zealous. Uh, and I told us that that word zealous is the word vibrancy, is the word of fire upon the inside of you. And Jesus also used the word in verse 19. He said, you say you are rich, you have become wealthy. All right, he said you have become. So they weren't always in that particular situation. And therefore you see some people who are very vibrant. And then they become wealthy or they have a job now and they don't pray anymore. Have you met people like that? Um, they say, all this prayer meeting you have is because you are poor. <laughs> when you become rich, uh, you will not have time for God as you, as you used to have time. All right? Uh, or they say, uh, when that woman gets married, she's not going to born again. Why, instead of burning, she will be burning for her husband. Glory be to God. Amen. So, people say certain things that um, tells you or try to say that it is okay to lose your fire. Uh, we do not know for certain who also planted the church at Laodicea. But we know that Epaphras planted the church at Colosse. Right? So, Colosse was a place that was close to Laodicea. It's like Ibadan and Lagos. Right? So, you've heard of the book of Colossians, right? Okay, so that letter was written to the church at Colosse. All right, and in that letter, Paul also said that they should read the letter he wrote to them at a church in Laodicea. All right, so it is said that Epaphras is the one who started the church at Colossae. Okay, why is this Bible, why is it teaching us history? Okay, so it is said that it was Epaphras. Epaphras was one of the disciples of Paul, was the one that started the church at Colossae. Actually, Paul had never even visited them when he wrote that letter to the Christians at Colossae. So that means he did not know them. He just heard about them and what God is doing in their life. And there was also a church close to them that is called the Church of Laodicea, right? So he said to them that they should read that letter in Colossians chapter 4, verse 16. He said, now when this epistle is read among you, see that it is also read in the Church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. That means there was a letter he wrote even to Laodicea, but we, never, we don't know where the letter is, some people believe that it was the same, maybe book of Romans. Some people say it's a different letter, but we don't need all of that. But this is the way I'm going. Could you believe that a church that had, uh, that was started by a direct protege, that had Paul as an oversight, as a spiritual oversight, will become a lukewarm church? Can you believe that that church, I mean, this is Paul, Apostle Paul, who wrote all of the new, I mean, one over four of the, of the New Testament wrote all the epistles, started a church, and they lost their fire. Or he didn't start it directly, but somebody who knew him personally started a church, and they lost all their fire. They became a lukewarm church. People can become lukewarm. Dear friends, one of the clear things in life is that nothing ever stays the same. Everything changes. The other day, I stood in front of a mirror and I was seeing the mighty invasions of the gray hair strands on my hair. I don't understand that. I used to be somebody who has black hair all over, very dark. I've never dyed my hair. I'm very proud of my dark hair. But I saw in the mirror and I was seeing gray hair and I'm like, Oh boy, I'm so young. What is this invading about? I don't understand it. But nothing stays the same. So my wife laughed. So she now came to the room. She losing her hair. And I saw it. Her own was not strand. They were, 
they were invested in a particular area like that. I said, oh my God. Baby, things are happening here. Oh, growing old, baby. So some of you right now do not know why you are so tired. And you are not that tired some three years ago. I have news for you. You are getting old. What is wrong? Why is this aggressive grow of, of gray hair? Why is it so aggressive? Am I? We did not, I didn't fight you. Why are you like this? Do you know that according to the second law of thermodynamics, it states that energy is never lost. Sorry, that energy is transferred or transformed. As more of energy is transferred, more of it is going to be wasted or lost. So energy is lost because energy is transferred. That's the second law of thermodynamics, right? So, as you are right now, the more you pray, the more energy goes. It's a natural law. Physics did not do it. The same God that created us made that law. You see, when we say law, we only discover it. They don't make anything. They discover how you operate. They discover gravity. It's there. They didn't create it. All right? So, the more you pray, sir, the more spiritual energy goes. <laughs> uh, the more you fast, the more you cancel people. How many of us are good cancelers? The more you cancel people, the more you give, the more your energy goes there. And that looks like the first law of thermodynamics that says that energy can never be created. Neither can it be destroyed. It can only be changed from one form to another. Past physics. Is it chemistry? It doesn't matter. Just understand what I'm saying. Energy, therefore, can be transferred. So when I lay hands on you, spiritual energy can be transferred into you. But do you know what that means? It means that when I lay hands on you, virtue left me and come into you. How will, what happened to that virtue inside of me? That's how Jesus knew something left him. Something was transferred. Therefore, it takes continuation in the presence of God if I'm going to continually be filled. There is something called spiritual burnout. It is given without receiving back. It is always given without taking back. You can become empty because you are being used. I don't know whether you have ever been in a church where they work a lot. You know, you go and lazy in this church. We don't really work that much. Amen. But I've been in church where they work a lot. I mean, there are all these programs after programs. After you finish planning the one, and that time people has come out, another one has come. So sometimes you get home and you are saying you are tired. But you know it's not just physical exhaustion. You know that your spiritual man is also running dry. I don't know whether you have been in that state before. Listen, dear friends, you have transferred energy into programs. You have transferred energy to counseling and talking to people. The energy of the Laodicean church was depleted. And I've found out that it's so easy in a city, I mean any kind of city, to have your energy depleted, it should be your spiritual energy depleted. The more wealthy the city is, the more easy it is to lose your spiritual energy. I was talking to one of my mentors, and he said, one person called him one time. I said, Baba, how are you? He said, that faith you used to teach us, I think I don't, I have a problem. He said, I don't understand. He said, I don't have anything to use my faith for in the UK. He said, so I don't understand how I'm going to use my faith. So how do I still practice my faith here? Because I don't have to believe God for light. I don't have to believe God for money. I know what to do, and I know how to plan my life to know exactly how much I need. And I also do not need faith for my health because I know what to do exactly for my wealth to be in place, for my health to be in place. And if I have a problem, I do NHIS. Even if I just feel I'm tired, I'll just walk in there because I'm not paying. <laughs> Is faith a Nigerian thing? Is faith an African thing? Faith is spiritual. Faith is the way we live. But our energy, what has happened is that the world has depleted their spiritual energy. Do you discover, if you have moved and migrated, you've not lived all your life in Lagos, 
and you have friends who have not lived all their life in Lagos. One of the things we have found out is that why they were in the interland, they were born in more than they are born in the city. Do you have friends like that? Oh, that's happened to you too. So I say, mm, because you know that's your reality. Amen. Glory to God. Because you were born in Emando Shambhala. Yeah, Bills is the one pursuing you. Wealth as a way of depleting your energy. It's the reason many of us no longer born for God. Our life is like a race. Paul said that we must run with endurance the race that is set before us. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. To remind you of what I said last week, I said vibrancy means to be hot. I said it means to boil with heat. And I said that vibrancy is the word, it's not the word zoe, it's the word zio. Right? You just replace the E with the O, and it becomes zio, and that talks about burning with fire. Can I ask you a question this morning? What is the state, what is the temperature of your spirit man? Is it cold? You saw that slide that that lady was just sleeping. Is your spiritual man just sleeping? It's tired. I'm t- even my tired is tired. What's your boiling point like? The opposite of vivancy in spirit is coldness in spirit. Some of us here have a cold, frozen spirit. Have you ever eaten chicken that is hot? Just, just, you know that's one of my love languages. If you don't know how, you know now. It's one of my love languages. Fried chicken is one of my love languages. Chicken should be fried. I don't understand why people now say eat LD. I put it inside of one and bring it out. Chicken should be fried. If you are going to eat it, if you are not eating it, leave it alone. If it's snail, it's okay. But it's chicken. Chicken should be fried. And when, I, when there's chicken mouth, they don't say, we are, you know it's Christmas, it's, it's for another day. That day, as it's coming out, give me my portion now. I don't even mind eating my own without it anymore later, but give me my portion now. But I've never been moved by cold chicken. You know, when you bring it out, you put your teeth, you won't do it again. Because it's frozen. Some of us, no matter what the spirit says, our spirit man is frozen. It's cold. It's freezed. It's not even thawed. Out. It's freezed. Oh, it's very freezed. Therefore, the things of the spirit does not move you anymore. You make your decisions by senses alone. I'm telling you the three kind of spirits. Some people have vibrant spirits, right? Some people have cold spirits. And some people have, so some people say, don't say cold, I say freeze, frozen spirits, because there's a level to these things. Cold is, frozen is even worse than cold, right? But all of it is not good, right? Now, there's also down the, what they call broken spirits. A spirit that is disappointed. A spirit that is offended. A spirit that wanted something from God and didn't get it. A, a broken spirit. Is, 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 is the primary demon that the generation face. That's why you hear about mental health, anxiety, depression. It's a broken spirit. It's a broken spirit. If your spirit man is on fire, you can have depression. If your spirit man is whole, you can have depression. It's, 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 it's what, you see, the Bible language for that is called a broken spirit. And Jesus told us in Matthew 24, verse 12, that one of the reasons why these things happen is because of sin and wickedness. And that will be the sign of the end of time. Matthew 24, verse 12. It will be a sign of the end of time, of the end of age. We are going to see all of that. I don't know what may have killed your fire. It might be too much wealth. Right? I, I, I remember, long story, uh, when I was serving, I met a lady who graduated with a Two and a half was last in accounting, I can't even remember. And she said the way she, the way she used to read at those days was that it was too comfortable. She had to move out from her father's house to be in a place that is not very comfortable uh, so that she can be able to read. And sometimes she would go and take hot breaths. Uh, and she does everything so that she will not sleep. I mean, people go through all of that. It tells you that sometimes comfort can be a problem for vibrancy. Too much comfort can be a problem. Uh, if you will stay in the sitting room, instead of going to the room to sleep, you will discover you wake up at night. Because you see, that, 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 that sofa 
uh, it's not very comfortable. But you see, when you are sleeping in that room with the AC at the prime, and you wake up, even when the spirit wakes you up, you think you are praying, and then the alarm rings again. You say, ah. I didn't know what has gone on. It's comfort. Sometimes, uh, well, that's why I laugh at people who say they are praying on the bed. There's levels to this thing. There are prayers you can pray on the bed. And there are some you have to stand up. And there are some you have to kneel. You have to kneel. And, and kneel where? Uh, sometimes I, I, I want to be pain, be very uncomfortable so that I don't sleep up, especially when you are tired. Uh, what are you trying to say, sir? I'm saying that if you have lost your fire, there is hope for you. Some of us, it's offense, it's disappointment. Some of us, it's delay, it's anxiety. Whatever it is, I've come with the word from God that God will work it out. Do you know that song we used to sing? God will work it out. God will work it out. One thing I know, one thing I found, God will work it out. There's restoration with God. 85 says, they will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you. In Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Peter told them, he said, repent that the times of refreshing may come to you from the Lord. There is something called times of refreshing. Every one of us needs seasons of refreshing. Seasons where the water of God comes over our spirit again. Seasons where we, where we go, come aglow again. Seasons of fire again. Seasons of retreat in God again. Seasons of pouring and impouring and impouring of God. This is what I said. I say outpouring. This is the seasons of inpouring. When God just keeps pouring to us again and again and again. We all need that season in our lives. So I want to teach you on revival of fervency. How do I revive my fervency? How do I revive my fervency? And that's where, that's, that's just it. I told you that I was supposed to end this last week, right? But so that you will not, we will not close the service by one. So I cut it into two. All right? So this is the second half. How do I? I've told us about the areas of affluence last week, right? So what are the areas of affluence in the word, number two. Affluence in spirit, number three. In fellowship, number four. In worship. So you are not. You press your phone. That's not fervency. All right? Fervency in worship. Fervency in what again? In prayer. In prayers. And fervency in love. I think so. Right? Is that all? Those are the areas of fervency. You need fervency in worship, in prayer, in praise, in love. Those are fervency. All right? So how do I ensure that those areas of my life are enacted with the fire of God? That's what I want to teach you. How do I ensure? Number one, very quickly, find yourself a vavent company. Find yourself a vavent company. Proverbs 27, verse 17, scripture says, Iron sharpens iron. So a man sharpens the countenance even of his friend. Psalm 55, verse 14, we took sweet cancer together and we went to the house of the Lord in company. Listen, Jesus sent them out two by two. He sent them out. There is a company of glory. There is a company of grace. There is a company that will bring fire to your soul. There is a company also that will douse your fire. Do you have such a company that will elevate your spiritual life? Do you have a company that will elevate your prayer life? Do you have a company that will elevate your worship life? Do you have a, such a company? I've always maintained that we are called to live and run the Christian race as a community. You see, when people say we have a tech community, all of them, that's from scriptures. We are supposed to be a spiritual community. We have friends. You hold that person by the hand and you ensure that that person prays. Do you have somebody you can call and say, can you pray with me? Let's, can we have one hour of prayer for the next one week? Do you have that kind of people in your life? Do you have people in your life you can call and say, I just think that God will have me press into more. And I will not get to the next level except I press into more. Do you have people you can pray and come together and begin to worship God together? Do you have that accomplishment? I mean, yesterday as I was traveling, uh, I was coming back to Lagos, uh, and Tola was sharing on how they would just stay in their room, and then somebody would play in the keyboard. And somebody would be, and they would be worshiping God and praying. Don't you think that's a sweet company? 
Don't use it as a sweet company. You have a keyboardist in the house. If I have a keyboardist in my house, ah, ah, it will be sweet. And he said, he said, when you just feel like God wants to do something, and I say, yeah, come and play keyboard. I say, yeah. You don't know that you should be paying that person. That's a company. A company you can, I mean, that's a house that I can go and live there. That's a sweet place. Sweet fellowship. The disciples, how good, how pleasant is it? One, two, three, one of Psalms for brethren to dwell together in unity. You know, we are a generation that lives by ourselves. One of the folly of a generation is that you can do life alone. You can't. Nobody can do life alone. You will need support systems. You will need people to help you. The reason many people are more depressed in our generation than generations before us is because people are living alone. It's because people think they can undo life alone. Now, when challenges come, they do not have anyone to hold them by the hand. Listen to this. Our plans fail. Our goals fail. Our objectives fail. Life as is thought, you know, it comes with it. It's thought happening. It comes in stored with disappointment. Some of the ladies know what I'm talking about. How you do, I say, of course. <laughs> Somebody who has asked you out, you think you have gotten a husband. And suddenly, he's on his way to the high with somebody else. Glory to God. Disappointment. When you get disappointment, who do you, t- disappointed, who do you turn to? Folks, we've got to bind ourselves together. Do you hear what I'm saying? We've got to bind ourselves together. There has to be a people they will call, uh, they will call these are their papa folks. Uh, these are the island people. These are the Sulele people. These are, we've got to have a, band, a banding together. Not because we agree on designers. Uh, not because we agree on perfume and fragrance. Uh, but we understand that we need each other in order to stay on fire. Listen, your company will determine your travel in the spirits. Your company will determine your sojourn in the spirits. How far you go is not about your personal revelation alone. It's about your company. You need a company. When I began my journey in the spirit, we had a group of people we called believers class. We gathered together. We are between 15 and 20. We were not much. Sometimes we come from meeting. We are not more than seven, more than eight. But oh, what power flow among us. Oh, what, 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 what reality and substance of the spirit we caught those days. It was such a beautiful moment in God's presence. Sometimes we'll sit on the floor just to worship. Just to worship God without looking at the time. We were a company of people who encourage ourselves. Because sometimes I go to those classes. I go to such classes, meetings. Discouraged. But I don't live discouraged. You know, sometimes even your prayer life can be discouraged. Do I have any people who came to church today? I, do you know that sometimes you can discourage praying? Because you have list that has not been answered. But when you get there and you found somebody with a testimony of a prayer that was answered because you people prayed together three weeks ago. You know God is in the neighborhood. He must not have done my own, but God is in the neighborhood. This God is real. When you look at your own personal life alone to determine the essence of God, you would make a mistake. So you have to compare notes. You have to look at somebody's life. You have to, there needs to be a company of fireful people amongst us. Sometimes you catch fire because you are working with fireful people. Sometimes you increase in your prayer life because your best friend prays. Because your best friend prays. And sometimes your prayer life got doused because people around you are not praying. I still don't understand how your best friends and best cliques will be, not, will be non-Christians. I don't understand it. Am I saying don't work with unbelievers? If you are here, you are going to work with unbelievers. But your best people are people who don't pray. How will you? We, we can't agree. Because my tenets and values are determined by scriptures. We can't agree on many things. You need to have a company of fire people. Think back to when you were in school. When it seems to you that you are on fire for God, there was a company. Sometimes we enter prayer meeting and we're working like this. Your mind is somewhere else. Maybe at GPY, 222, GNS. You're just thinking about an exam. And then you're just there. And then you look at somebody who has started groaning. And you're like, ah. Maybe that's the flesh. And somebody else is like this. Oh, God. Oh, God. And you're like. So something tells you in your mind that you better get your fire. 
God is releasing something here. God is releasing something here. God is releasing something here. So you discover that you to you, you become serious. It's how, it's how it works. Sometimes we say, Holy Spirit is moving now, and somebody's pressing full. And suddenly so somebody say, ah! And the person just put the phone in the pocket and say, Pass me not all jet to save you. You need a company of fireful people. You need it. And I found out that Christians are not intentional about that company. We see ourselves in church and we just say, hello, how are you? And that's the end. And then we wait to see ourselves next Sunday. But that's not how you make friends in the world. In the world, you keep in touch. Hello, how are you doing and all that? You, you keep in touch. You call them during the week. You need to be more intentional about your fireful friends. You need to be, hello, this week, what's your plan? Can we pray together for two days? 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. on Zoom. Is it okay? Or WhatsApp, is it okay? That's how to be intentional. That's how to be on fire for God. You can't be dusting your Bible every Sunday and think that God's fire will come. It has to be consistent. Dear believers, I don't know how to say this, but it's very simple. If all your friends are unbelievers, it will affect your vibrancy. It will affect your vibrancy. That's just the truth. Number two. So, what's number one? I like you, student. You know this is still a learning job. I can't hear you. Say it again. Find yourself a perfect company. Say it alone. Find yourself a perfect company. Are you listening to me? Say it alone. Find yourself a perfect company. Good. It can be you next time. Are you following what I'm saying? Find yourself a perfect company. Number two, be passionate about your love for God. This is how to renew. Revive your vibrancy. Be passionate about your love for God. You know, many times when I find out that it seems like my love for God is going down, I sit, I sleep, I stay on the bed, and I lie down there, and for one hour, all I keep saying is, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. I am passionate about my love for him. I just, no prayer, nothing. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Somebody say, they indoctrinate people in, in Asia, in China. Everybody needs a good indoctrination. It's what you are washing their brain with. Everybody needs a brainwash. It depends on what you are washing them with. Training your child is brainwashing your child. Any way you think about it. All right? Just ensure that you are brainwashing yourself with the word of God. Because the word out there will put some things inside of you. You need to wash it away every morning. Every morning. Every morning. Do you know that the way people dress when they come to Lagos is not the way they dress when they, outside, when they were outside of Lagos? Because in Lagos, you just see that. Oh, so I can't expose this. So this is not really exposure. I can't wear this clothes. It's not really bad. And before you know it, you also start doing that. You know why? Because you think that the community says it's okay. Listen, your fervency is based on your love for God. Many of us don't love God. We use God. I say it again. Many of us don't love God. We use God. It's when you need money, you call on him. It's when you are stranded, you call on him. You don't really love him. It's like an ATM machine to you. But that's tough. I feel like I should stay there and keep saying it because some people need to hear that. We don't love him. We just use him. You know, it's the relationship you have with your ATM machine. You know when you look for an ATM machine? Do you know when you do for an ATM machine? When you need it. When you need to withdraw. I've never seen anyone who walks through an ATM machine and walks it and say, I love you. I just miss you so much. I love you. You just go there and press the code. And many of us, that's what we do with God. You press the code. You know, your word says in Matthew 7, 7, ask and you'll be given, seek you will find, knock and the door will be open. You are not in love with God. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. With all your mind and with all your soul. Not that we first love him, but that he loved us and made his son the propitiation for our sins. And by this shall all men know that you love me. First John 4 19. When you do my commandments. He's doing the commandment of God that shows that we love him. Keep saying to yourself, I love the Lord. Love God, desire him, stay in his presence. Just long for him. 
have an emotional relationship with God. Listen, is the reason we have a personal God. The difference between Yahweh and Obatala is that those ones are not personal. You have him somewhere, if you want to get into his presence, you travel home to see where he is. That's where you worship him. But Yahweh is right here, right now. That means you can, it can be personal to you. You don't need a deity or you don't need a go-between. You don't need a priest to get to him. You can get to him. He's a personal God. Yahweh is personal. Have you treated him like that? Has he been your personal God? Or is he the God of your fathers? Has he become the God of Isaac? Has he become the God of Jesus to me? Has he become the God of Jesus to me? Has he become your God? God came to the earth so that we can, he can be close to us. And we can be close to him. I don't know how this will pan out. This next session will pan out. But we're just going to do it. Amen. We're just going to do it. Why not take a God love break for three minutes? Uh, you know we do a praise break. Where we just praise God. We take three minutes just praise God. Why not take three minutes to love on God? I don't know what that means for you. If that means you sing when you want to show him you love him. If, if it's that you just want to say, God, I love you. Jesus, I love you. But start now. Just keep loving on God. Three minutes. And don't sleep. Because sleeping is not loving him. I don't know how that is for you. Let's just love on him. If your word is, is, is love language, then tell him how much you do love him. If he's singing, sing. Love on him. Don't love on the anointing. Love on him. Love on him. Love on him. Be intentional. Now you are preaching to yourself. This is the practicality of Avense. What you do here, you can do at home. What you do now, you can do again and again. This is how your prayer life will not be boring. I will not just be one way. Take time to just love on God. With the all of my heart, I love you. Just love on God. Look at where you are. Look at where you were 10 years ago. It was the love of God. It wasn't your prayer. It is the love of God. Just, just love on him. Just love on him. Just love on him. I know you are not where you want to be, but love on him. Love on him. Nothing else makes sense. I just, I just want to love on him. I just want to be where you are, dwelling daily in your presence. I just want to love you from my heart. <laughs> Two more minutes. Just love on him. Just love on him. Love on him. Just love on him. Wow. Wow. It's becoming real to you. It's, it's becoming more and more real to you. Just love on him. I tell you one thing you can do, which I do. I just find words to say to him. I find words, expressions of my heart. Words. I just tell him. Tell him how good he is to me. Tell him I can't do without him. Because it's the truth. I don't even want to do life without him. I've never even thought of how life would look like without him. It's a reality I'm not interested in. It's you alone. Only you matters. Only you make sense. Moloreka Jesu loru kore. Moloreka Jesu loru kore. Koda miri bani kodo juti miri. Ore odo do mani Jesu loru kore. One more minute. Moloreka Jesu loru kore. Koda miri bani kodo juti miri. Koda miri. Beni kodo juti miri 
Ore odo odo mani. Jesu loru kore. Molo reka. Jesu loru kore. Koda miri. Beni kodo juti miri. Ore odo odo mani. Jesu loru kore. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. He's my lover. He's my beautiful friend. You should have a response to loving God. It can be praising. It can be shouting. It can be dancing. It can be lying down. But I have a response. I have a response to loving God. I have a response. I have a response to loving God. I have a response to loving Him. I have a response to loving Him. Iadosh. Iano mekeliadaba sobre de bosh. Ele volumbra i kaya wo shi agare i baro de bosh. Ele mone bare de volumbra kale kaya de bosh. Ze bare bele 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 Thank you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, and amen. Raise your head, look at me. How does that feel? Sweet. Do you agree you need to do that more? You've got to do that more. And then number three is what I call the hunger principle. The hunger principle. How do I re-energize my fervency? How do I revive my fervency? Is what I call the hunger principle. I found a key that has really helped me is what I call the hunger principle. Here is how it works. In the natural, the more you eat, the less hungry you are. Do you know that? The more you eat, the less hungry you are. No matter how hungry you are, when you sit down to eat, as you eat, your hunger fades away. But the spiritual, the opposite is true. The more you pray, the more hungry you are to pray more. The more you read your Bible, the more hungry you are to read the Bible. The more you worship, the more you want to worship. That also means that the less you pray, the less you hunger for his presence. Most people don't understand this spiritual law. They don't know that it takes hunger for, to, for more to happen to you. If I want more anointing, I need to hunger for this anointing. And the more this anointing is upon me, the more the anointing comes. It means that in the spiritual, hunger is the basic way in which you are going to ever be filled. If I'm not hungry, I'm never going to be filled. Right? And hunger will increase you. The more you eat, the more you don't want to eat in the natural. But in the spiritual, the more you eat, the more you want to eat. That means hunger creates hunger in the spiritual. In the physical, hunger creates satisfaction. But in the spiritual, hunger creates more hunger. Hunger for his presence will create more hunger for his presence. Hunger for the world, we create more hunger for the world. Hunger to pray, we create more hunger for prayers. So if you are not praying, it's because you are not hungry. And if you don't start by praying a little, you will not be hungry for more. Somebody say, I need time to spend one hour in prayers. Start with 20 minutes, start with 10 minutes. The more you do that consistently, the more you are able to do more. It's called the hunger principle. That's how you increase your fervency. Stay hungry. Look at neighbor and say, stay hungry. I can't hear you. Lukewarmness starts when you are no longer hungry. When you say, I've arrived. I have the anointing now. I have God now. I have revelation now. Listen to this. Anybody can pray when it is good and enjoyable. But our enemy ensures that our prayer life is boring. That's his gist. He wants you to be boring so that you can stop praying. And only those who are soldiers will keep digging in. Are you a soldier? Then keep digging in. Number four, you've got to keep sin out of your life. Sins are little, little foxes that spoil the vine. Live a holy life. James chapter 1 verse 14 to 15. God demands, the demand of our lives is to live a holy life. Holiness is the key to the fire that never sleeps. 
Holiness is the key to the fire that never sleeps. Holiness is not boring. Holiness is beautiful. Because God is beautiful. Holiness is not ugly. Holiness is beautiful. Because God is beautiful and he is holy. Nothing drains us of God's anointing like sin. And by sin, I do not mean fornication, adultery, and stealing alone is part of it. I mean things like offense, like bitterness, like disappointment, like anger. It will drain you of God's power. Envy will drain you of God's power. Jealousy will drain you of God's power. Bitterness will drain you of God's power. Bitterness is like taking poison and expecting someone else to die. Let no one tell you it does not matter because it does. Number five. How do I revive my fire? Heed the summons of the cross. Heed the summons of the cross. We must start seeing the cross as the ultimate. Jesus is the focus of our lives. We must start living for him. We must start living the song we love to sing. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. We must start living it. We should not sing it. We should let our moments and our days be for him and his pleasure. Where people surrender to fame, surrender to limelight and wealth, but we must live a life surrender to him. We must live for him, just Jesus alone. We must take up our cross. And follow him. It's the expectation of God for our lives. And we must do it. Matthew 16, 24 to 26. Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after him, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The battle that our Lord faced over the cross was won in Gethsemane. There he sweats, as it were, drops of blood as he struggled for full surrender to, to his father's will. You must also have victory in the place of prayers if you are going to be revived. Whatever God has called you to do, pray. And pray some more. And pray some more. Somebody say, you don't know, what, don't know sir. I need a job. Pray. Somebody say, you know what? I need a husband. Pray. Somebody say, my heart is not settled. Pray. Prayer is the staff of the believer to walk with God. It will get more with God with God to pray. Let me say this to you, and I love it when God said this to me. And many of you don't know that it takes a level of pride not to pray. Can I say that to you again? It takes a level of pride not to pray. Pride tells you you are enough. The result is dependent on you. Prayer screams, I need God. I need God. Every time you pray, you are saying, I need God. Listen to this. I am permanently in the I need God colon. Permanently. In the I need God colon. I know I need him. I need you every hour. Oh, blessed. It's a song like that, right? Yeah. Every hour. Bless me now, my Savior, I call to I need you every hour. It is in his presence you find strength to go again. Strength over struggle and agonies. Only after you have won can you surrender to the cross. Notice Jesus did not surrender to the cross until after Gethsemane. If you do not carry, if you do not pray, you will not carry your cross. If you do not pray, you will follow Jesus. Everything is dependent on your prayer life. Do you know that things begin to get wrong for many believers when they stop praying? They don't know because the devil won't show anything. But if you trace the history of your issue, it came when you stopped praying. The problem started when you stop praying. Do an analysis of your life. Your vibrancy, your loss of vibrancy came after you stopped praying. 
If you go back to your closet again, you will walk in the anointing. If you go back to your closet again, you walk in the prophetic. People bother and fear is a proof that you have not said your prayers. If I can pray, then I can surrender. Surrender brings death to our carnal nature. Subject our desires to the divine will. You know many of us, our major problem is pleasure. That's why you can't be revived. I've got news for you. News flash. News flash. You need to stop that subscription. Amen. Should I say it again? You need to stop that subscription. That one on your phone. That Netflix. You need to stop it. If you don't stop it, it will stop your spiritual energy. That's why you have watched all the movies. You know people come to church these days and they sleep in church and they say it's the pastor's message. No. It's because you watch movies till 2 a.m. There's no light. So it was hot. Yet you can hold the phone like this. And it was not hot. You do not have spiritual energy. You have, your carnal nature is what drives you. You are sa, you are sarkikos. You are a carnal person. If you want vibrancy, you need to stop it. How can you want to watch all the football match in Euro 2024? How? How? So from 3 p.m. till 9, nothing against just football. It's 2. Okay, it's 2 they start now. From 2 p.m. Ma, to, is it 9 they finish or 10? 2 to 10. Every money for the next one month. At the moment that is done, Premiership will start. The devil has given us a job. I'm telling you. I found out that I, I, I love football, but I found out that football can kill your spiritual life. So I, I, I watch Euro too, but I've, the longest I've seen in this, I've only watched two matches, and I watched 10, 10 minutes out of them. So I don't think you can call that watching. This is crazy. I was in London, I was in the hotel room, and then how can France and Netherlands be, be, be playing football on the day I'm supposed to be, be able to be preparing to preach? It's not fair. Ah! And I saw it. I was talking to my wife and I was seeing it. I used to say, what's that? I said, don't worry, it's football. So after she, I said, now you need to go. I need to prepare. And then I put it at the background. Then I had to go. You know, I told you, that if you listen to the Holy Spirit, it will be easy for you. He said, so you came all the way to watch football match. I just pressed the red button immediately, and the TV went off. How? Because I listen. Imagine I finish watching it by 10. Ministration is 12. I say, ah! Listen, dear friends, you are your own enemy. You are your own enemy. Some of you are watching three series now. On Amazon Prime, on Showmax, and on Netflix. Different one. You have watched Chairs of Love. You have watched Bridgerton. And yet you cannot finish a series in the Bible. You can't finish a book in the Bible. Sometimes I wish pastors are giving the powers of our fast. <laughs> Honestly. Because people in that religion, by the age of 18, you have finished reading the Quran. Before, before, before 12, self, you have read the Quran. And they don't give you biscuits, biscuits and sweet like children in church. They will slap the madness out of you. The two shows, they come to the house and do, if, if Afa beats you, your father cannot beat Afa. Because your father is subjected to Afa. We have been begging you to finish reading the book of John. We have been begging you to read the book of Romans. Something I know that a slap can do it. I know. I know. They're just, they just, bam, like this. You, you ask them to You see, we, the reason we, we there, there's no discipline. I'm not asking for discipline. I cannot even do that. I'm not, I'm not disciplining myself enough. But I'm saying that we do not need to be forced to do the things we ought to do. God loves us, and that's why he has given us that leisure to determine what we want to do. But honestly speaking, if you look at the time you spend on your phone, 
If you don't leave that phone, you will not touch God. If you don't leave that phone. You know, before you say leave food and touch God, that's a waste of time. Food is not the problem because it's expensive. <laughs> now you've got to leave your phone and touch God. And then six and seven very quickly. Stop listening to your excuses. Romans chapter 1 verse 22, 1 of Romans, thou are inexcusable, O man. The only problem with our excuses is that no excuse is tenable to God. No, nothing you will say will make God say, oh, you have an excuse now, you can take a break from your spiritual disciplines. And God will not say, ah, oh, no, no, you are serious? That your workspace, they want to, ah, no, no, don't, don't play again. No excuse can make God say, no, 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 I didn't understand that before. Hey, yeah. Oh, we are going to your menstrual period. Oh, no, sorry, it's hard, sorry. It's your children. No, sorry, uh, there's no excuse. It is in this place. Have you read Luke chapter 14, 16 to 24? You know, in Luke chapter 14, 16 to 24, there was a party. And they didn't come. They didn't show up. Those who were invited did not show up. And what did the Bible say? The Bible says the master of the party told them to go to the highway and the edges and bring everybody. And he said, compel them to come. That word compel, there is the word anagazo. It means compelling power. It means it is not their choice now. Just carry them and bring them. It's compelling power. Anagazo is the key to spiritual vavor. I don't feel like praying, but because I am compelled to pray, I just begin to pray. I don't have to feel like reading the Bible, but an agazo will make me start reading the Bible. I don't have to feel like praying in the spirit. An agazo will make me start reading the Bible. It's a compelling desire and power for God. It's the key to starting and maintaining spiritual vivacity. Many things you do, you must do because you are compelled to do it. But you know the difference? Instead of an far compelling you, the Holy Spirit needs to compel you. Let me say this to you. If you let go of all your excuses, you will learn spiritual disciplines. I found out that when I used to say that, you know, when I have my own house, I will pray. It's a lie. When I have my own house, I don't even pray. Because comfort has now come. When I get my, you see, it's, it's because I'm staying with people. When I stay on my own, I will pray. Have you had people say, when I get, when I change job like this, you see me in church. Have you had people say that? Oh, you are not answering because some of you say it too. <laughs> the things you say you will do when things change, you never do them. To change, change now. If you cannot change it, despite and in spite of your present prevailing condition, you will not change it when situation changes. And then, I think I have to stop here. Be a God chaser. As the deep panted for the water, so my soul long after thee. You alone are my heart, desire and I to worship you. You. Christianity on a campus that was heavily influenced and affected by Tommy Tini through his book, God Chasers. He gave a picture of men and women completely in pursuit of God. Men who thrive in the love and in the presence of God. People to whom nothing else matters but God and God alone. If God is dealing with you this morning, 
You must do all you can to play your part. Play your part. Wake up in the middle of the night. Play your part. Consistently pick and stay in fellowship. Play your part. Pick portions of scriptures and begin to read them. Nothing will change in our lives if we are content to where we are. We must realize that many of us are caught in a trap. And the only way to free ourselves is to be desperate enough to lose ourselves and go in pursuit of God. Will you chase God this morning? Will you be in pursuit of God this morning? As I've been speaking, someday I've been telling you I know where I stopped. And I'm going to go back again. Close your eyes, everyone. I am done. I'm asking you, do you want to be a chaser of God? I'm going to read that book as a church in the month of July. God chasers. But I want you to just ask yourself, I just want you to determine, it's not a book that will change your life, it's a personal decision you've got to make. Are you going to chase God? You know how a man chases a woman? You know how you are chased? You know how you are looking for a job? Are you desperate for God's presence? Are you desperate for a word from God? One word? One word? Just one word from you, O oh God. Are you desperate for God this morning? Are you in chase of God this morning? I'm going to get better in my desire. I'm going to get better in my desire. I want God and nothing else. I want God and nothing else. Until you can lay hold of God, nothing will change in your life. Let me say this to you. When you take one step towards God, it will take a thousand to you. The prodigal went back home and the father ran to him. He went back to the father and the father ran to him. If you go after God, God will run towards you this morning. Is there somebody who is saying, I'm tired of using God. I just want to be in a love relationship with God. I need you, oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. Don't worry, don't sing with me, just, just pray. Come, I'm my Savior, I call to thee. I need thee every hour. Oh, bless my time. Talk to God. I want you. I need you. Something more than gold. Something more than gold. The Spirit of God in the heart of man is something more than gold. Something more than gold. Do you desire more than gold? Something more than gold. The Spirit of God in the heart of man is something more than gold. Something more than gold. Something more than gold. The Spirit of God in the heart of man is something more than gold. Something more than gold. Something more than gold.